Okay, welcome back. So our final speaker is uh, Michael Havano, who will tell us about Fabinius extensions, link homology, and foam evaluation. Thank you, Josh. Let me thank Ben, Sarah, and everyone else involved in the organization of this conference for, uh, for putting it together. And for, and it's a pleasure to, to talk. So I'll talk about um, Fabinius extensions, link homology, and foam evaluations. And this is going to be a very, very quick Overview of two recent papers, one joined with Lou Adrian Robert, the are with Nito Kishno, they're both in the archive this year. So let me start with the first paper. Um, so as, as we know in the usual SLT link homology, uh, we, we can build it up starting from just um, Frabinus extension when we have a ground community ring and we have a community Frabinus algebra of rank two over R and more specifically with a basis one and some other element X. Um, and so R is community phase, Frabinius over R with a trace um, of rank two. And so the original case was X square equal to zero. Uh, generalized case was drawer. Um, so he looks at X square equal to H X plus T where H and T are formal variables. And of course, you can do various specializations, but let us look, let us really concentrate on this uh, general case. So here, uh, H and X have degree two, T has degree four. The ground ring is polynomials into variables. Um, so it's useful to really think of this as the ring of symmetric functions into variables with H and T being um, the first and the second up to assign symmetric functions into, into other variables of degree one, of degree two. Um, and you can think, of the of the kind of original pair RNA as the homology of the point um, with coefficients in Z and of A as the homology of the two sphere with coefficients in Z. And then you can interpret the modified case using um, a covariant homology of the point for the group U2. And then U2 acts on S2, you can think of S2 as CP1. So U2 acts on it. You can take a correct homology with respect to U2 and you get this quotient polynomials in X modular this relation X square minus HX minus T equals zero. Um, and and um, for, me, it's, for me, this was kind of an easy way to understand the Rasmussen invariant using grading, graded, graded structures, not filtrations. You just set H to zero, you keep T and then you kill the key torsion and link homology and you just have well, two copies of the polynomials in T left, and then you look at the positions, position in the grading of those two copies, and that tells you the Rasmussen invariant. Um, but what we're gonna do today is we're gonna start with this um, pair, so ground ring R, community Frobenius algebra A, or R of um, index two, I put here, this means extension of rank two, with generators one and X. And then we look at two different extensions, where we, we can either enlarge the ground ring R um, by kind of passing from symmetric polynomials into variables to just polynomials into variables, or we can invert the discriminant of these polynomials. And we can always, you can also do the two modifications at once. So I, I will see what this corresponds to starting with the U2 equivariant theory. Um, and passing to U1 plus U1 equivalent theory. So U1 plus U1 is a subgroup of U2, but it's a very nice subgroup. It's an abelian subgroup. And they actually end up with a larger space than this one. Right. And at the same time, we can invert the discriminant. We lose almost all the information, but for instance, Rasmussen variant um, keeps track of this degeneration into the corresponding theory that is semi-simple. Um, so let us move on. The next slide. Um, so in the U2 theory, we have, let me change the um, labels of the variables to U1, E2. So here we have, um, well, we have variables X1, X2, and then E1, E2 is symmetric polynomial. Oh, sorry, let me, um, sorry, let me take this back. So let me again, just start with this extension RNA. I just relabeled H into E1 and T into minus E2. So these are the degrees of the generators, two, four, and two. Um, this is the defining relation, x square minus e one x plus e two, a trace. 
this is these are the roles for commodification. And so what we did here, we just observed an extra symmetry that was pointed out in the recent paper of Bidekova, Utira, Verdi, and uh, Hovenkamp, um, where we introduced hollow dot. So I recall that this X we often denote by a dot on, on, a, on a facet. And then we introduced a dual dot or hollow dot where we take just E1 minus or H minus minus the usual dot. Um, this dual dot, and let me call the dual dot X2, let me call the original X, um, X1 and the dual X, E1 minus X, X2. And then when you do this, you see what X1 plus X2 is E1, X1, X2 is E2. So there's this symmetry of taking, of permuting X1, X2. And that's a symmetry of A that fixes every point in R. And so this dual dot is useful, for instance, you can write down the neck cutting relation in this form with just two terms. This is the identity map of the circle, is the two terms, so this dot is dual dot, this is a usual dot. And vice versa, you can switch, so you can put a regular dot here, you can put a dual dot up, those two cases. And um, if, and we can, we can kind of look into this further, if you take if you take a torus, uh, so uh, um, torus with one boundary component, uh, you can compute and that in the sphere, uh, torus is given by the difference uh, usual dot minus a hollow dot, so it's one minus x two, and let me in fact call it denoted by a cup with a star, so just star stands for handle, I just take a star and convert it uh, into a handle. Um, uh, so if you take this x1 minus x2, um, what is it? It's actually, if you take the square of x1 minus x2, you get the discriminant of this polynomial. Uh, so this is how x1, x2 expressed using x. We take the discriminant, um, we get this expression uh, in e1, e2, so it's a symmetric function. Um, and uh, so let's try to kind of get some mileage out of this. Um, uh, so again, this, this is kind of, so what we get is that we have this handle with one boundary component. It's now an annotation for it, so it's a star dot. Star dot is this difference, the usual dot minus the dual dot. And the square of the star is actually belongs to the smaller ring R. It's not just an A, it's an R. So we can write two dots on a facet as just D times nothing, d times the facet. Or in other words, two, two handles with one boundary circle is this, it's just d times a cup. And if you want to go to three handles, three handles and you close up. This is boundary component, here you close up. There's three stars, two stars you can reduce to a d. You're left with a sphere with a star, sphere with a star, evaluates to, well, we apply the epsilon. Epsilon of x is x1, so epsilon of x1 is one epsilon of x2 is minus one because e1 is a constant, we can take it out and epsilon of one is zero. So um, epsilon of star is two, so it's 2d. Well, that's the value circle. So this goes back to Bart um, original paper on, on these deformations. And you can also write the star as m delta of one because we start with one. If nothing, we create a circle here, so we, um, kind of the unit map and we use do delta to go to two circles. Somehow I lost and that looks a little bit deficient. But then you do M, and you do M. So this is one, this delta of M of one, this whole thing, element of A. Um, uh, so, so the idea is now is introduce, so, so let's just take R and enlarge it by inverting D. So we localize along D, so inverting D. Um, there is no problem here. Um, so invert D, so we can form all of the, uh, they take this larger ring with the inverse. And we can also do the same to A, tensor A with RD over R, so we allow negative powers of D in A as well. So then AD has, is twice the size of R of D. So A of D still has the basis one and X, one and uh, one and X as a free RD module. And um, then we can topologically, we can think of this as an anti-handle. So we just call, we, we can, because we inverted D, we can define uh, form of the star inverse, the inverse of the star dot, 
to give this, take the usual star dot and multiply by d inverse because we can do this now since so that's allowed in the ground ring. So, so if you take this definition, it's a definition of anti-handle or anti-star dot, if you multiply them, so put them next to each other, well, that's the same as take this and add a star. And so then two stars is D, it cancels with this star, so it's just identity. So when we do this, so again, the point is that this is just the square root of, the, of D. So this handle is square root of D. So we invert, inverting D is the same as inverting a handle or inverting the square of the handle. So we have this inverse of the star dot. Um, great, great. So it's kind of, kind of anti-handle. You can think of this as a cobordism of genus minus one with one boundary component. It's negative genus cobordism, um, this thing. And we can put this, um, as long as we work in this larger ring, Rd and the corresponding ID, we can put this inverse dot on any facet. So for instance, we can take the co-multiplication map given by the copans and add the inverse of the star dot there. Um, and uh, so this is the same as just put the usual star dot and multiply by D inverse in the ground ring. So what happens then if you have, if you have a handle, so if you compose this cobordism with, with, with the pants, with the multiplication cobordism, you get this picture where you have a handle with top and bottom boundary circle, but you also have the star inverse. And then when you convert the handle into a star, you have star star inverse, that's one. So in words, this cobordism is identity in our kind of evaluation. Mutation. So we kind of, um, what it means is um, we have, we had multiplication in our regional Fabian algebra A, and we still have multiplication in this localized ring A sub D over R sub D. So we kind of, we passed here, we now work over the ground ring R sub D, R with D, I hope it's not too small, but I don't know, I, I hope it's readable. Um, so this is our ground ring, R with inverted D, so this is our D discriminant. And we have the ring twice that size with basis one and X over our D, uh, same relation. Um, and in this ring now, the multiplication AD turns already into AD. It can, it, I mean, this as a map of AD bimodules has a splitting given by delta of D. So given by this copens with star inverse. And this com composition is identical. And this is a popular notion from number theory where so most finite field extensions are separable. So it's kind of, it's very useful in number theory. Um, so for us, it means that you can check with the corresponding homology theory of things. It's going to be, it's going to be a very minor variation on these theory. So this is going to be depend on the linking numbers and it's going to have the rank equal to two to the number over RD. The homology of any link will have rank two to the Two to the k, um, um, yeah, two, two to the k, where k is the number of components of a link. So this is kind of almost with this theory, with very minor difference. So making inverting d makes ma makes the this kind of this extension of this algebra separable, but it kills almost all the topology. But later you recall the Rasmussen invariant by looking at the generation from the original theory to the separable theory. And so that's, so we started here in this corner with this extension. We know to leave pass here. So, so the result is almost trivial, but at least we have this kind of familiar terminology from, from field theory of separable, separable extension. Okay, um, let me, let me keep going. Oh, okay, so now we're gonna move here. And here it means, um, so we already had here X and we actually, we, Observe some symmetry by changing x to x1, same as x and x2, e1 minus x. But we can also just expand the constants. We can just say that now e1 and e2 are going to be elementary symmetric functions in some new variables, alpha 1, alpha 2, that are different from x1, x2 here. So we just introduce um, more variables, alpha 1, alpha 2, with these rules. Um, uh, so let's see what would. What, what would that give us? And again, this is passing from U2 equivariant to U1 plus U1 equivariant. 
so we pass from the smaller ground ring to this larger ground ring, alpha 1, alpha 2, with these rules. Um, and so A is also enlarged to now R alpha of X modular. The nice thing here is that after this, ex after this kind of extension, the defining relation factors into the product of linear terms X minus alpha 1, X minus alpha 2. Uh, because this product is just uh, this one. So particularly see what this ring has zero divisors, X minus alpha 1, X minus alpha 2. And you, know, you can see that commodification become in some sense even nicer. For instance, delta of one is given by this sum of these two terms where we distributed alpha one and alpha two on the two sides of the expression. And there is some symmetry. And x minus alpha one, x minus alpha two behave nicely under commodification. Um, and you can also do everything pictorially. You can introduce a dot circled by a sort of a circle one dot saying it's x minus alpha one. So it's a dot minus alpha one. Circle two dot is dot minus alpha two. Then the star dot is one plus two. Circle one plus circle two. And this, is, this might be actually hard to see. These are also some um, rules. And this will say, for instance, that so these two dots annihilate each other. This says dot circled one, circle two next to each other is zero. So they annihilate each other, which we also see from this formula. This product is equal to this, equal to zero. I forgot to add zero here. Um, if you put two of them next to each other, two ones, you get alpha two minus alpha one times one dot. So it's kind of almost like an impotence up to scale. But to be able to scale to idempotence, we, we, we will need to invert D. So they're not yet idempotence. And then, so there are some kind of nice rules for simplifying or modifying a torus with one handle as the sum evaluations. Um, and uh, so the point that you, um, somehow you get more flexibility with this ground ring. So you get more flexibility as you pass from UQ equivariant to U1 plus U1 equivariant, even though it's a small group. Uh, let me for now bypass this for a lack of time. Um, so this is what's happening. We go from U2 to U1 plus U1 equivariant. And this now factorizes into linear terms. And I don't know if this has any relation to singularity here, here, to singularity theory, because you kind of see this zero divisors. This is the simplest instance of ring of singularity. Uh, and I want to say that so we kind of wrote up, we kind of really like this cube. Let me just, again, briefly go back to the cube. So you can invert the discriminant to get to these Fravins extensions. This reason. And from the viewpoint of ring homology, it's almost trivial. It's not about linking numbers. Or you can, enlarge the ground ring by adding this alpha one alpha two. And in fact, this ring is isomorphic to this ring by sending alpha one to X, for instance, or alpha two to X. They're gonna be isomorphic over R, but they have different meaning. So this axis have different meaning from this axis. This is enlarging ground ring. This is adding, this is homology of circle versus over homology of the empty, over homology of the empty. But they are isomorphic and the whole cube has a symmetry. And um, if you combine them together, that means you have alpha one and alpha two, so you, you one, you one, and you invert discriminant D, then in this extension, you can actually introduce an importance. You can have E one, E two, take the quotient to X minus alpha one by alpha two minus alpha one, and likewise here. So you actually get the composition of this ring into the product of two copies of the ground ring R, R alpha D, we call it because of D inverted and alpha, so this ring. So alpha one alpha two and we invert alpha one minus alpha two. Uh, and this is, this is kind of uh, really this theory. Usually it's written by specializing alphas to different elements of the ground field, but you can think of it this way. So at the kind of bottom of the square, you get at the bottom right of the square, you get kind of the the kind, of the, the kind of the most basic structure, but the degeneration is important. Let me, so since our paper in the archive a couple of months, several months ago, so there was some, um, kind of some interesting developments. There was a very recent paper, in fact, this month by Rostislav Akhnechet. Um, and so, of course, there's this well-known APS homology for links in the Soviet 
Torus, as I have the core homology, and people have looked for covariant versions of it for a while, as I understand, but Ross found it by specifically using you want to see one equivariant story. Somehow U2 doesn't work. You didn't get this alphas, alpha 1, alpha 2, that we have in uh, the ground ring of U1 to C1 for infinity to kind of to alternate things as you, you're on an annulus, you can go, go towards the hole in the annulus and you need to alternate the action by using alpha 1, alpha 2. And so, uh, so you then apparently get a version, a different version of a TS homology, but you really need the larger ring. And as I understand, it doesn't work over YouTube. So I refer to his paper for details. And then there was another paper that um, I learned about. It's also very recent by Takesh Taketa Sana on fixing infinitiality. And as you know, the usual the kind of the usual homology, it has this problem with the minus sign, overall minus sign and the cobordisms. And it's been fixed by Clark Morrison Walker using seam lines and declarations and by Carden Caprao and using gel two forms, like Christian Blanche, and was also later work of Pierre Vagel. Uh, um, Sama uses, as I said, you want to see one equivalent theory. Again, I've only looked very briefly at the papers, I haven't um, worked through it. Um, he essentially uses the same story, just different notations. He uses V and U instead of our alpha one, alpha two, and he uses C for alpha one, alpha one, well, alpha one minus alpha two, so it's just square is D. Uh, but otherwise it's uh, the same ground ring. And so it allows him to, um, to hide, I mean, to avoid the minus sign. And otherwise you need seams or gel forms to avoid it, as I understand. And this relies on his early paper from 2018. So, so these are kind of two nice, two nice applications of this uh, really when you enlarge from U2 equivalent to U1 plus U1 equivalent, you get more freedom. You have this L1 over two and at least for some constructions, it's useful to just use alpha one or two interchangeably in order. And you don't have this ability in, in the YouTube equivalent. And also I forgot to mention here application zero and that just form variation because Robert Wagner form variation, really I mean, to write things down, you need all polynomials and not just symmetric polynomials. So to write it down, you need the ground ring, which of course they call it X1, X2, X3, Xn. So here we just should, should change the notations to alpha one alpha two for convenience. The notations are different, but to do form variation, you in the kind of, in the most natural way, you need to enlarge to u one to the n equivalent theory from u n equivalent theory. So that's kind of application zero. And of course, that's what motivated partially our paper, this paper. Um, and so I just wanna, before going on the break, let me again, just put, put this picture of the cube. This is the summary, so the front the front square gives us the extensions of the ground ring R using alphas or inverting D. And then the back square just follows by tensor product. Take the tensor product of A over R with this bigger ring, or alpha RD or this one. And you get three theories. And really, these two theories, this one and this one, are versions of this theory. And this versions allow the importance that decompose the ring, the homology of the circle, in the product of two copies of the ground ring here. Uh, so probably let's stop here for the break. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, we'll reconvene at 11.58. In the meantime, let's ask some questions. So when you invert the discriminant, you get the cohomology of the fixed point set, right? When you invert the discriminant, um, is it, um, but fixed points of what? Of uh, P1 on which uh, U1 cross U1 acts. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, yeah so, so maybe I need to learn more about the story. So, so the principle here that for nice actions, for nice actions of what, of U1 to the N, Inverting with discriminant response to specializing to fixed points. Yep, and there's two fixed points, and that's what you get. Yeah, mm -hmm. so <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what's a good reference? What's a good introductory reference to to this kind of fixed points versus inverting with discriminant, or in, I guess localizing, certainly localizing, inverting something, inverting enough to just work over uh, some product of fields, I guess. 
For some nice spaces, the cohomology, equivalent cohomology embeds in the cohomology of the fixed point set. Mm -hmm. That's all I know. It's okay, so is that yeah, I I guess, you course, like cut hits, cut hits or some or some other paper? Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, that. Mm -hmm. There are some good references for these fixed points kind of things, but but the the question, of course, is like, is this really action of anything, or are we just calling it equivariant? I mean, do we really have? any statement that connects this with the equivariant action or is it just appears to be an equivariant action yeah, so my guess is that if you use if you use comments or calculus approach using cardinal shifts my guess is that if you um on suitable varieties if you introduce action of gl lender then you well, well you have to be careful right so then then maybe you recover equivalent theory and definitely expect this to happen in the symplectic story. In the right. side of Smith and Abu Zayed and another, right. another story on the symplectic side. And then you also have four categories on appropriate queer varieties. So expect that the queer variant, of course, it's very hard to define, but I guess one of the goals is that in trying to develop a queer variant for higher four categories. And then as a special case, in the setup, you recover the, the equivalent homologies. But I agree with you. Takes a lot of hard work to to interpret this as some kind of equivalent cohomology. Um, I mean, also there might be the stuff that Jordy was actually talking about. Um, I mean, if you're th if you're thinking about SL two stuff as tensoring standard wrap a bunch of times, then, then tensoring with. I mean, maybe through geometric Satake it corresponds to something that has a C star action. By yes. so I mean, my sure. of it is easy. My of it is easy, so we just, oh, yeah, so we just kind of take it on faith. So, but, but, but yeah, ultimately, there are at least I mean, potentially three ways to see it, but each way is tricky. Coherent chips or Fukai lawyer or Satake. I mean, I, I hope that as a, that there are going to be more ways to use this extension to help us because it really gives you more freedom. So potentially things that didn't work in the U2 or UN equivalent case might work here. And we, we've seen well, three examples um, from variation that's best done with polynomials and then variables. Ross work on APS homology in the current case and Sano's work on the reality and the geometry case. No, you want to see one case. Um, if there's no more questions, uh, we'll begin again. Okay, okay. so let's, um, let me now tell you about um, the joint paper we need to teach law. Um, and uh, so the idea here is that you can, you can look at uh, GL2 forms. So, so, so first of all, um, Emmanuel Wagner and Audrey and Robert, they have formulation that works for all GLN forms. So let me just specialize the GL2 forms. And GL2 forms, they go back to Blanchett, we use them to, um, to get rid of the minus sign in the cabordism invariant, invariant, pulling cabordisms. And they, uh, they've studied by uh, Michael, Daniel, and Katharina in two papers on GL2 forms. And in a more recent paper of um, Anna, Matt, uh, Christoph, and Stefan. Um, and so let me actually just look at Robert Wagner variation specialized to this GL2 case. And they'll also review the deformation from this joint paper. So we take a form F in our fee, and GL2 forms are particularly easy. And GL2 forms, they consist of facets that could be thin or thick, or thin and double facets. And the facets meet along singular edges, and the edges actually, for closed forms, they always turn into single circles because in the GL2 case, there is no room for single vertices of forms. That's a really simple case from this viewpoint. So the local model of a GL2 form is that you have thin facets that are surfaces, thick facets, and you have singular, singular lines, single circles where three facets meet to thin one double, 
excuse me, and you need, you keep track of orientations. In this oriented version of GLT forms, you keep track of orientations. And the orientations are so that, well, in the one dimension over, what you see is the more, well, sort of MOI graph orientations for the graphs of thickness, edges of thickness one and two. So you can just have two thin lines merging in double line, keeping orientation, or you can have double line splitting into two thin lines, keeping orientation. And then we do go in one dimension up, but we still keep track of orientation. So we want facets to be oriented so that a thin facet is oriented compatibly with the adjoint double facet, both of them. And they're opposite oriented necessarily along this image. So if you split, the orientation is reverse. And um, we also allow dots on thin facets. And as usual, you can add dots to thick facets, but they're going to be symmetric functions and humanities. And um, out of this orientation convention, we can get induced orientation. So once you have an orientation for one facet of a connected form, you automatically get orientations on all the other facets just by traveling through the form, inducing orientation. And if you have a contradiction, it's not a it's not an oriented GLT form, it's something else. Um, so you just need to know one orientation to get orientation everywhere. And we can also use orientations on the, on the, on the singular circles, just using, for instance, this convention in this picture. So from an orientation of a double facet onto, onto the boundary. And then we can use this to always select a preferred thin facet out of two. And, and what we do is that once you have this orientation, we position so that the double facet is below us, below our, um, our eyesight, and we look along this orientation of a singular edge. Then we have one facet on the left, one on the right. So that was just, uh, say the preferred facet is this one, the one on the right. Um, so we go clockwise, so we go counterclockwise from the double facet, and the first facet we hit is the preferred facet. Now let's talk about evaluation of GLT forms and evaluation is given by uh, coloring. So coloring is a map from facets into subsets of a two element set, two element set because of GLQ. And for GLM formulations, it's more complicated. You have a set of N elements, facets have thickness from one to N and to a facet of thickness A, you assign a subset of cardinality A. But GLQ case is very simple. So you just have 10 facets so then you assign a subset of cardinality one. So you just choose one of these two numbers. And to a double facet, you assign a subset of cardinality two, and you have only one choice. Just assign the entire set, one, two. So really there are no choices for double facets, but for thin facets, you, um, it's either one or two, but then you require the kind of flow condition saying that the, the labels, the colors of facets, of thin facets, must, um, the reunion must be exactly the coloring of the double facet into which they flow. And this means that this is color one, this has to be color two and vice versa. Uh, so that's the condition. So let us have some notation here. So for a given, so for a given coloring, you know, by a phi of C, the union of facets colored I. So, so here we would take this facet for color one and this facet for color one. So this would be our part of our F1. And part of our F2 would be these two facets. And it does also form the symmetric difference F1 to FC. Um, and symmetric difference means just facets in one, but not in the other. But that's very easy because this is just all thin facets. Because the facets, it's colored by one color, but not the other. So in this in the kind of special case of GLT forms, F1, 2, this bicolor surfaces are very easy to describe. It doesn't depend on the coloring C. It's just the union of thin facets. So F12, F12 is going to be just the union of thin facets. Um, and or maybe, so this is an example. So here we took, took a form which has three facets, a double facet in the middle, a thin disk above and thin disk below. And we choose the coloring. This is color one, this is color two, this is color one, two. And then the surface F1 of C is the union of facets colored one. So this upper is two. F2 of C is the lower is two. And F1, two is just the union of thin facets. It's a kind of big, big as two. And um, 
So this three um, subspaces are actually surfaces and they're closed. And they're surfaces because they're locally in the neighborhood of every, every point they're surfaces. As you can see from this picture. You take two facets out of three, you get the surface locally. Um, and they're closed, there's no boundary, form, form is closed. It's closed. Um, and they're orientable just because they lie in the two. They're orientable, well, even if you didn't have orientation conventions, they would be orientable because they're closed in R3, but actually here they're actually oriented. Um, and because they're orientable, their well, the characteristics are even. And to write down the evaluation, in this case, we need, we need to look at this orientation. So we, um, we choose a singular circle, the loop along it, and then if we see one on the right, it's positive. If we see two on the right, it's negative. And let theta plus or C be the number of positive surface, the number of times we see this configuration along the circle. And then we define the sign of the coloring C to be the sum theta plus, plus half of the, or the characteristic of the surface F2 of C. So we just choose one of the indices, just two. F2 and take the half of the or characteristic of this closed surface. And we write down the evaluation of the format coloring C as minus one, uh, minus one to this integer, S of FC. Here we count dots on facets labeled one and take them to the, so it's X1 to the number of dots on facets labeled one times X2 to the number of dots on facets labeled two. And here we just look at simplicity. So we assume that there are no dots on double facets for simplicity. And we divide by X1 minus X2 to the characteristic of F1, T over two. So this term does not depend on C. In the analog of this formula for GLN forms, you'll have by sources F, I, J, F, C, and for them, the term will depend on the choice of coupling C. So here it doesn't. Here it doesn't. Uh, and uh, we define the evaluation of F as the sum of all colorings. Now, how many colorings are there? Well, if you look at, um, at the thin surface, at the point you, at the union of thin facets, it's, it's a union of connected components. And every connected component is colored in a checkerboard way. One, two, one, two, one, two. Uh, for instance, here it's one, two. Um, and you can flip the columns, you can switch to one along this component. And that's all you can do. And if you have K components, you can do two to the K changes and that's all you have. You have two to the K columns. So, so I copied the evaluation here. And then the sum is over two to the K columns. And I showed the picture of this move where you change colors along the components a lot of the component from one to one to two one two, changing color along the component. And um, so Robert Wagner variation in the gl case is the sum, and you can check the denominators cancel. So, I mean, in a given coloring, you can get a denominator if this number is positive. If this number is positive, that, that means you have some two spheres in your surface, and if you have more two spheres than anything else, so to speak. If this number adds up to positive number, you get denominator. But you can check that for every two sphere that can contribute as denominator. If you flip the colorings and take the sum, things cancel out. So you can check that actually the sum is a polynomial. And it's also easy to see that it's symmetric because you can just interchange one and two. Uh, so we get a symmetric polynomial instead of just a rational function. And out of this mechanism, we can build state spaces for, 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 uh, for planar graphs, for planar graphs. So just look at a graph you get as a cross section of a GLT form. And then as usual, you can build a state space by looking at all the forms with that boundary, modulo universal relations. And of course, you, you just get the usual state spaces for, for the GL2 link homology theory, which is more or less equivalent to SL2 link homology. So you get the usual two to the K or a case a number of circles, thin circles in your, in your GL2 web. Um, uh, but the point is that this generalizes to SLM and it gives Robert Wagner a way to get state spaces for, uh, for uh, SLM or GLN MOI graphs. And it's a purely commentary approach. And so that's really, really nice.
and development. And um, that's why I'm here on a, on a kind of on time limit. So let me tell you uh, instead about the deformed radiation. And in the radiation, so we, um, so we, we have it for GLN, but for GL2, what happens is um, you take the formula and you add an extra terms because you see we used the oil characteristic of the symmetric difference F12, but we didn't use oil characteristics of F1 and F2 themselves, except in one position, except in the minus sign in, in S. In the minus sign, we used the oil characteristic, but that's all. That's all. You can just put them in, uh, put them in. So Introduce variables P1, P, P1, two, P2, P2, one in this exponents. So this is the original variation times powers of P1, two, P2, P2, one. And you, if you want to get something integral to the end, you need to use power, you can use power series. You can say that PXY is a form of power series with formal coefficients, BIG. So it starts with one, so it's invertible, but that's a formal coefficients. And then you define P1, two, two, to be PX1, X2, and the symmetric P2, P2, one is P, X2, X1. And with this convention, you know, the things will divide. So if you take the sum of the deformed variation, we will get the symmetric polynomial, well, and almost that simultaneously symmetric under permutation of one and two indices with, uh, kind of with, with this condition. Or you can just work with uh, rational functions in, in this kind of um, And uh, so, so we check that, so it gives rise to state spaces. Again, in our paper, we mostly worked out the GL2 case. And so GLN case is not easy, even in the, I mean, there's been a lot, it's a very formidable piece of work where they worked out that this the radiation gives rise to state spaces that are um, finite, finite kind of, they are three over ground ring of rank equal to the graded ring, graded rank equal to the graded dimension graded or equal to the M of Y invariant on the planet. It's kind of very sophisticated work. Uh, so let me just give you some examples of, of this different variation. So take a two sphere, a still with thin sphere with M dots. The new evaluation is we insert this P1, 2, P2, 1 into the evaluation. Let me call it row M. So the original variation just gets you the um, complete symmetric function in exponents. So here we get this extra piece. And again, if you expand the power series, you can cancel and get, get the integral expression. Uh, then this is P0, no dots, the station, P1, one dots, the station. And for more than for higher indices, and you can you have an induct, inductive formula, that's the same as in the usual case, because you still have this, you still have this inductive goal. And um, for the double for the double sphere, you get the product minus the product of the sphere, so it's called rho. And if you look at the degrees, so you are just getting more generators, rho null, rho one, um, with this opposite degrees, kind of opposite from two and four, zero minus four. And you can you can this rho, you can express it as everything else using rho one, rho null, you want it in this way. And the way to think of it is we kind of be deforming the trace map in our Cardinian stars. We start, we start with this basis. Kind of, we want to have, say, we want things to be the same as before. So, so we want to have a basis of a cup and a cup of a dot for the state space. Then we can just pair them up in all possible ways to get this collection of spheres with zero, one, one, and two dots. And they evaluate to these numbers. And uh, we want this to be a basis and the, the kind of the reflected diagrams to be the dual basis. So then we want at least we want the to be invertible. And the determinant is exactly this expression. This one. Uh, that's another way to get to this expression and of this deformation. So what happens really here is that we're deforming the trace map such as the trace of one is run all. Just trace of one just close up by, by, by a cap and get sphere with no dots, that's run all. And X uh, here, close up by a cap, you get zero with one dot, so you get with one dot, you get row one. So this is our deformation. And we working with the string uh, and some of the string R with these degrees. Uh, this is the small ring. 
but having deformed trace that gives us excellent parameters. And um, let me see um, again. So this, I want to say, oh, this is, yeah, maybe I, I'll skip this point. This point. So, so we kind of, we, the kind of, we introduce this deformation. I can actually go to the next slide. So we introduced this uh, deformation motivated by, by looking for connection to formal groups. So, so the Robert Wagner variation has terms xi minus xj to this only characteristic in the denominator. And um, whereas uh, in algebraic topology, there's deformation of this difference um, of the sum. You deform the sum by higher the terms that are usually form of our series, not polynomials such that this is a formal group. Formal group means that it's sort of a half algebra in the appropriate completed sense. So if you can work from x and y to x tensor one, one tensor x, and some expressions, questions, you want to have a half algebra structure. And this plays a big role in algebraic topology. Um, and from talking to Nita, as I understand, so uh, the way you kind of convert from x plus y to this uh, more general setup is that if you look, look at the usual cohomology, and you compute the churn class that can pass of the line of the telepolitical the line bundles, so you get the sum. But in, in some other fancy of homology theories like um, K theory or compass homomorphism, you have a complicated expression for the churn cross churn class of the telepolitical line bundles. It's C1 plus C1 plus lots of other stuff. And I think the only case when it's kind of easy to write down is in this case of K theory, where you just have this extra one extra term. Beta x i, where beta is a formal variable of degree opposite from degree of x in one, so degree minus two. Um, and then in this, when you kind of convert to this, realize to the deformation, so x plus y is deformed in a complicated way, and then x minus y is also deformed. So let me just write down as x minus y divided by the power series. And then our idea was to take the power series and put it into the foundation to try to recover some kind of generalized homology theory of links. Um, the hope was to get something like Lipschitz Sarkar, um, or some sort of variations, um, uh, Chris Chris Poor has a theory. Um, then Levin and I, long time ago, had a theory for braid closures. So we have, have a braid um, diagram to define this theory, but it works to give homology operations on the complete key homology. And Nito's work from last year, just the papers, also gives a um, spectrum version of various link homology theories. Uh, so firstly, any additional kind of interpretation would be great. But so, so far we checked things for GL2 and we, we seem to be getting this deformation of the Fabian's algebra structure. Is that the last slide? Okay, that's the last slide. Uh, uh, but still, so it, uh, kind of it's uh, Robert Logan deformation is I think very promising, so, and it's already accomplished a lot. Uh, so I think any any modification of the deformation could be extremely valuable. So we're kind of we're trying various, we're trying various approaches here. Uh, and so, so this is the, so the deformation is given to. So, so let, let me stop here. Thank you. And let, let us thank the organizers for, for putting this together. Well, let's also thank uh, Kovana for that excellent talk. Thank you. Um, and let's thank all the speakers for this whole week. Uh, Some great talks. Um, all right. Any questions for Mike? I have a Go question. Um, so, in this form evaluation, you don't, um, it depends on the form where, which is embedded into R3, you said? Yes, yes. But you can use it when the form is embedded into any oriented three manifold, right? Yeah, but when it's, just, it's harder to guess, it's harder to find out, it's harder to find the variation formulas for closed three manifolds. I agree with potentially you want to, potentially you might want to evaluate forms in closed three manifolds. 
Um, again, you have to be careful because you know forms in R three you can take a cross section of that form. You get them. Um, you get a planar graph. So that kind of very convenient. So if you if you it's uh, it's a little bit less clear what to do in any three manifold. But I agree that it's an open problem to find nice evaluations of forms or even just closed surfaces embedded in three manifolds. Find nice geometrical examples, evaluations, or algebraic, any kind. Yeah, I think it's an open problem. Evaluation is anything beyond R3. Mm -hmm. Um, I was wondering if there was some philosophical reason. So for me, like the um, Robert Wagner foam evaluation, sort of first you construct some giant, um, not symmetric polynomial, but anti-symmetric polynomial. And then you, and then you apply your demo operator to get a symmetric polynomial. Is there sort of like a, a fundamental philosophical reason why you should think that everything is phrased more nicely and easier in terms of anti-symmetric polynomials? Well, I'm not sure it's specifically anti-symmetric because you know they, they they divide by products of xi minus xj's to the exponent of the only heuristic over two. So sometimes it's even, sometimes it's odd. It really depends on the I mean, it depends on the on, on the coloring. Um, but to me, I mean, the way I think about it is that this approach to me is sort of complementary to all the other approaches to homology because they managed to be the most material. And I have said this before in my talks. So they managed to be the most material, so they just have this form variation. Forms not free, and then eventually they they get kind of everything, including including. Well, I mean, you need the consequent work of uh, Daniel Paul. Um, so this Daniel Paul, and I think Michael, Michael Eric. Um, you need to get the kind of the full story for to extend to linkabordisms and link homology. But it, it kind of it works. It gives a very clean construction. It's the most material, and you you can postpone. So to me, they kind of it's complementary to the many constructions we have available for link homology. In the MY case of conversion on subsets of MY, we have many versions, but all the other ones for general and so on, they require uh, they require working from categories from the very start, like working with the highest weight categories of higher quality categories of coherent shapes categories. Which is not 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 non trivial, not easy. And here, to me, as I said before, this is this approach is the most similar to statistical mechanics. You write some kind of partition function, and then work your way from there, and to, to get everything. So it's the most complementary, and it's complementary because you can hide you can you can hide category theory and category and poly category theory for as far as as, as humanly possible. So you can move it to the. Um, you can, you can kind of you, you forced into it later than in any other approach. Then, and can then I... everything is kind of I mean, um, it's probably not easy. It's probably it can be tensionally hard to get this, but at least it's kind of Ben, would, Ben, should I just say one word about your question about philosophical reason? So this is adding to what Mikhail said. So if you look at the affine nil Hecke algebra and you ask what is the kernel of all the de Maizeur operators and it turns out it's the symmetric polynomials but it naturally doesn't occur as a symmetric polynomial it occurs as the symmetric polynomials times the vile denominator so it's the you know it's the product of all the positive roots times symmetric polynomials that turns out to be the thing that's invariant um, and if you now, and then of course you divide by the, the, the vile denominator and you get your symmetric polynomials. So then you can ask, well, if you were to generalize this to any cohomology theory, you have these de Maizeur operators over there in that generalized cohomology theory. What's the notion of the kernel of all these operators there? And the right thing that shows up is precisely that. You get the product of all the roots, the positive roots, but in that cohomology theory. So the formal group law shows up there and it is a rank one free module over the symmetric polynomials, but it's non-canonically that. But there's no like, 
What do you mean it's not canonically rank one free? How do you not be? Comes time. It's a rank one free module over the vile denominator, and the vile denominator is not anymore anti-Semitic because the formal group law has gotten involved. It's it's a it's a formal difference of the roots, like mm -hmm. x i minus x j, but the minus is not standard minus. It's the formal minus. Mm -hmm. So it's not an anti-symmetric expression, right? It's, it's some expression uh, times the symmetric polynomials. Mm -hmm. Okay, now this is very interesting. I have like, you know, vague question, you know, is there some kind of odd version of this whole story when you work with not like symmetric polynomials, but some kind of anti you know, anti-commuting variables, because that would look more like statistical mechanics, because, you know, statistical mechanics people, they like this grasp on variables. And but so why, I, I guess, I mean, all I know, I mean, is this, I mean, from a while ago paper by um, Aaron Laden and Heather Russell, um, we have some kind of uh, odds, but I mean, there's only, you can only get this odd versions of divided difference operators. So there are several papers on that back maybe eight or nine years ago, um, Aaron's and Haver's paper, um, my paper with Aaron and, um, and, and Alex Ellis, and I think Alex and Aaron had one or two papers on that. But, but there is no simple way, I, I think there is no simple extension of known of RSL2 to SLM. Uh, you can, I mean, you can look at uh, the recent paper of Pedro Vaz, uh, and, but the, I think it's still SL2. So there is, there is an, Zergo by model. But I think there is no, there is no simple, uh, I mean, you need, kind of, you need to do something clever, I guess, really clever to get from SL2 on homology to SLM on homology. Uh, similarly, I mean, Alex and I tried to come up with odd circle by modules and failed to find anything, again, anything simple that works. It so. doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. You just have to, it's, it's going to have some unexpected, if it exists, it's going to be something subtle. It's going to have some unexpected properties we cannot guess. I mean, it's an interesting question to find, to find those fears. It's a fun I mean, you know, vaguely the same thing so happens in statistical mechanics, right? So like, uh, But so why is it similar to statistical mechanics? Well, in statistical mechanics, there is like the simplest, uh, uh, the simplest model is, uh, um, what's the name there? it's related to SL2. So that the, the POTS model when there is only two things. But, but then it's kind of hard to extend beyond that. So that so, so what's, I don't a good introduction, what's a good introduction to kind of to the easy and hard parts of statistical mechanics so we can SL2 versus SL and dichotomy. So what's a good introduction? I'm sure there's some talks by uh Stav, Stav Smirnov somewhere. Stav Smirnov. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. He, uh, he, uh, so, okay. so we will find this dichotomy between SL2 and SLN. Yeah. So is it a particular, is there a survey paper? I don't know any particular like, reference, but, but yeah, so. Yeah. Well, so once you dispel that guy's yeah, name. Yeah, I think we'd want to maybe a simplest example where a SL2 case is manageable in statistical mechanics and SLN is not. So you're saying POTS model and that's a SL2. And right. what's the SLN analog? I mean, there's like, it can make, change like a number of states somehow. There's like two states, two that's states, Ising that's model. So the Ising model is like the simplest model and it's just yeah. like, Simple as a SL2, but going beyond Ising model is kind of much harder. But it's but it's hard to test, right? It, it exists. It's at least it exists. At least it exists, right? Yeah, it exists. Yeah. So yeah. Like here we don't know how to define it. No. So, but so maybe there's some. I mean, it's worth exploring, of course. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so okay, could you spell that person's name? The the reference you said. It's Stas Smirnov. Uh, Fields medal like 20 years ago, statistical mechanics, that's easy to okay. pin down. Yeah. yeah, maybe Russian names are hard to spell sometimes. Smirnov, vodka, you know, vodka. it's like, it's uh, the most popular Smirnov. Russian name, like the biggest number of people with this name in, in Russian name in Russia. <laughs> so I think in, in two dimensions, the uh, easing model is completely solved at uh, critical temperature. But the POTS model is not solved. So I guess that's an example for why the SL2 case is harder than the SLN case that, in general. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right. I think this is a good time to thank the speaker again.
Thank you.